Hello, hello. Hi, Jirin. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, I I uh, had a I had a call while while waiting to come in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. So I think I think we're gonna start in about um, five minutes or so. So I've I've opened up the uh, the meeting room. So I think people are gonna join sure, uh, sure. as we continue, right? Yeah. yeah. We'll probably wait. Uh, how many people are we expecting? I think we 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 anticipating up to a maximum of hundred people to participate. Um, okay. Um, so because we are also live streaming this on Facebook, so um, we might get a few oh, questions okay. that we need to attend to. Okay. 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 Yeah. Just give me a second. I'll be back. Just right back. Okay. Drum. Is the live stream working?
Okay, good, good morning, Jerin. Um, I just want to confirm that you are ready to start. Should I start? Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we, we, we will start shortly in, um, in the next uh, two minutes. I would like to welcome all of you to this session, uh, specifically uh, where we are going to start off our session with Mr. Jerry Nteo from Singapore. My name is uh, Mokizi Benedict Ekere. I'll be the curator or the lead for this particular session uh, called Connecting the City Challenge for the City of Francistown. We are live streaming this session uh, on Facebook um, on the page Moana Africa. We are also uh, allowing you to join uh, through Zoom. Uh, you can share widely. The Zoom link is or ID is 662-278-3738. The password is simply 2020. Um, just as a bit of background, um, the purpose of this um, gathering or digital event is really to bring together great ideas in response to local challenges and opportunities in the city of Francistown. We appreciate the efforts of partners uh, such as um, Botswana Accountancy College, uh, Botu University, uh, Francistown College of Programming, VC for Africa, uh, Gen, Gen Botswana, the World Bank Group, uh, Stanbeck Bank, Orange, uh, Business Botswana, the city of Francistown, EdgeX, uh, Botswana Innovation Hub, uh, and also the South African Innovation Summit. So today will be a packed day of eight hours in which you get different content uh, from people that are leading the startup ecosystem. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, where I sit uh, is just to share with you that we are in the premise of a new economy, uh, and that new economy is defined by digital tech or multiple platforms where young people are able to connect digitally and build great companies. So I asked um, one of our lead experts, as you know, uh, from Singapore, which is a model country, to share with you how they've been able to do this to become a, a blueprint for the rest of the world. So he will spend the next 50 minutes sharing with you information about uh, how to build tech businesses and the resources that you need and the capabilities that you need to build such companies. Uh, this discussion will allow for a Q&A. It will also allow you to uh, participate by raising questions. So there is a chat box that you can participate in by raising your questions and comments. We'll also open up for discussion as, um, as Teo is making his presentation. So I think at this juncture, I would like to hand over to Teo to start the presentation uh, from inside from Singapore. I know he's been waiting for so many hours to start. Uh, so Teo, at this point, I would like to give over to you. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me here as well today to share with the fellow founders and the entrepreneurs here in, uh, from Singapore. Okay, uh, I think it's the morning there, so good morning. Uh, I'll just finish touching a little bit on the Singapore startup ecosystem and about the Lean startup, uh, a quick crash course on it. Okay, so a little bit more about myself. Himself, uh, specialized in go-to-market in Southeast Asia. So as is mentioned, I hate the gen in Singapore uh, do the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Week in Singapore for a couple of years now since doing it for. I uh, founded a software company and a venture builder. Uh, we received funding from uh, 
SPS and Quest Ventures. Uh, so the also we have to do course, and we have our chief uh, to help companies like venture uh, consultant, uh, uh, counselor to ASEAN Youth um, CIO Association. So this is the global startup ecosystem ranking from 2019 as uh, presented by Startup Genome. Um, so where you can see here, uh, Singapore is actually ranked 14 um, as a Hello. Great. Hi. Sorry, I think uh, there's something wrong with the Zoom itself. Uh, I've changed to another device. So I hope this is better. Can you see my screen? Great. Okay, good. Thank you. So I don't know where did I cut off, uh, but as mentioned, um, uh, I do ecosystem mapping uh, and also do go to market for companies and startups. Uh, planning to expand to Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, so the Singapore startup ecosystem is actually ranked 14 uh, as of 2019. Um, we have a um, you know, um, good pool of talents here and also look forward to have more talents like yourself to come to Singapore and be part of the ecosystem as well. So this is actually a startup ecosystem map that was created in 2017. So the government actually hired me to do this. Uh, and I did uh, pretty much um, you know, design of the ecosystem map and ensuring that uh, all the different stakeholders in the ecosystem are placed together. You have your VCs, uh, accelerators, corporates, incubators, government institutions at different various stages of startups as well. So in this ecosystem map, there's six key areas that the startups are, are in. Uh, the clean tech, Health tech, fintech, advanced manufacturing, ICT, which stands for information communications technologies, and biotech. 
and each of these startups are in a specific spectrum where they are a dollar sign attached to it. So we have uh, Angel and Sit Round, which is the closest to the center core, uh, the hot air balloon thingy um, image that you see there. Um, they are an Angel and Sit Round at less than 1 million Singapore dollars. We have the next spectrum, which is uh, Series A, less than $2 million. We have uh, uh, the third spectrum, which is the Series B and above, is more than $2 million. And eventually, the one at the corners are those that were acquired or have IPO. So uh, we have about uh, 70 over companies in, in Singapore that has been acquired or IPO uh, since then. So if you're thinking of doing something like this, ecosystem mapping for your own uh, organization, uh, ecosystems, countries, feel free to reach out as well. Okay, so the first most important thing I think we have to all start off is to start with why, right? Because um, essentially we are all founders, we are all entrepreneurs, we want to change makers ourselves, but you got to understand why are we doing this, right? So if you have heard of Simon Sinek, right? He mentioned about uh, why, how and what, the golden circle, right? So, well, I will just get on to the video itself so that you know more about the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire the other guys. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it. Whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why I make a profit, that's a result, always a result. By why I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. All right. So I'm not sure if you're able to hear the video earlier on, uh, but essentially the video that Simon Simon was sharing about is the golden circle. So the most important thing when you're trying to deliver your point across is why, right? Why do you, why, why is the cause, the belief, the reason why your organization exists, the reason why your startup exists and how, right? So knowing why, then you know how the why, right? And what's the exact thing you'll be doing, right? This do you sell the products, the services, Apple, right? What do they do? Or not just a phone, right? They sell the whole ecosystem of products. So it's important to find out uh, your why, your core purpose, how and what you are doing. And if you're interested to find more the goals of just Google and a talk that Simon Sinek do on Untapped, right? Okay, so back to the Lean Startup Canvas, right? So what does being lean means, right? So being lean means don't waste resources. If you know about it, there's innovation that we won't probably need for so the pillin so is nine then more lean startup and the it's itself go across around the world become the the main tool that used by startups around the world for their business model. So a startup itself is a temporary organization, you know, in search for a reputable 
uh, scalable business model, right? Are you able? Yeah, I, I think we can hear you, Teo. You can you hear me? Continue. Yeah, it, the sound is fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Right. So this graph itself, you know, uh, matching to what's growth and time is sharing with you. It is very simple and you know, usually SMEs and business owners, right? Because the SMEs are uh, small, medium enterprises are on a linear graph where they grow, you know, gradually um, on, the, on the linear Whereas startup has exponential growth, it's potential for the exponential growth, in fact. And yeah, so that's where startups actually disrupt the status quo, right? So moving on to the Lean Canvas, uh, I believe you should have already received a Lean Canvas template that uh, was sent over by the organizers. If you haven't, please uh, do reach out. And uh, you can also Google Lean Canvas and you can find the template. So the first thing was the ways where people start off with a lead canvas, they could start off with problem first. It's really up to you. Whereas the way that I'm, I prefer and, and we've seen success with it because uh, we have uh, actually two companies who actually been exceeded, you know, uh, got acquired, you know, and, and they all use the same way. Um, to start with customer first. Why? Because there are so many problems in the world that you could solve, right? But which is the, which is the problem that is painful enough such that customer could pay you, right? If you are not being paid by your customer, then you're essentially not doing a business, right? You're doing a charity. So find a customer segment that is right for you, that um, you know, that, that your why serves, right? And your, your customers actually value your products or services. Right? So essentially, you look at the customers you have and find the early adopters, okay? So if you were, you know, back in, 2004, uh, or the early days, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps, and then you have a, 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 you know, iPhone that just launched, right? So Apple is probably targeting people who potentially have used a PDA before, right? And that those are early adopters that could probably be the ones who actually used the iPhone or bought one iPhone. Okay, so look at the problems, right? So let's think about Apple, for example. What are the problems that Apple solved? Because back then you have so many devices, you know, to call, to to go online, um, to hear music. You have a, a Walkman, etc. Whereas Apple put all of these devices into one, right? So that solves your problem and that become a lot more convenient for you. So that's a problem that Apple on you know, the iPhone itself solved, you know, ten years ago. And they look at existing alternatives, right? So um, the problem you are solving essentially. Uh, customers pay for a product and service, whereas users just use it, okay? The early adopters are the ones uh, targeted customers, you monopolize, you build a, a huge market share from niche, and you develop your user personas that you would like to reach out to. So the problem itself, as mentioned earlier on, Apple in this case targets people who know find it inconvenient to have a MP3 player, you have a, um, you have a, uh, you know, a cell phone and you have yeah, a, a computer to go online, etc. So, all three into one and then that's where you have your smartphone, it's the iPhone that was launched, right? So, essentially, you have to understand what is preventing your customer from fulfilling these needs because these needs, if painful enough, they're willing to pay for it, right? And it's important to find out, you know, what exactly is the situation or the content their customer in, right? Find out the root cause or the reason why they're facing this problem. You know? A good way is to do is to ask why at least five times and they can get to the root cause. Okay? So how do customers then solve these problems today, right? So you could look at existing behaviors, right? So, um, you know, if they just you know, surf the, the, the net and they would like to be mobile, they like to you know, surf the net anywhere, anytime, you know, something handy in their hands will be good, right? So that's why I mean, that's why the iPhone actually solved the problem. And then look at the incumbents and competitors. The first important thing is not, is not I mean, everyone has good ideas, right? All ideas are great, but ideas are just ideas if you don't actually execute on them. So you let the incumbents, the competitors, you, know, you can think of 101 reasons why the competitors uh, you know, are not as good as you, but you are not your own customer to some extent, right? So you have to reach out to the customers to find out what are the existing uh, 
solutions out there, which is under this, if you see the existing alternatives, you know, how are these problems actually being solved today or are the problems not being solved at all, right? So that's where you can target your customers, okay? The third one is a unique value proposition and that itself can be a good unique selling point for you as well, okay? So it's important to find out though, why to solve this problem, what's end goal benefit for the customers, always sell the benefit, right? No one is cares about your functions, right? The functions could be 101, 1,000, 2,000, but essentially what is the core benefit for the customers, right? What do they do? your high level content in YouTube for, for this case, you know, before YouTube was being known, right? So Twitter was before YouTube. So you could say, um, you know, example of what your service or product is, is a Flickr for videos, right? That represents YouTube. So the high level concept helps someone to understand what do you do better. So you put your idea and the business model together and that's where you get a high level concept. Okay, you could be a, a Uber for food delivery and then they have to have you know, uh, a food delivery application of sorts, right? So how your product feels like, you know, like the big vision, you know, you get people to talk about it because when people talk about it, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the market for you to get input inside system, right? Important to always validate your customers, right? You may feel that, you know, this is the best design product, um, you know, function best for you, but, you know, you need like 10, 20, Hundred thousand, hundred of like who takes good pay. Okay, if not, there won't be a big enough market size. And if there's no, there's no market size for it. There's no market. Do it, right because no one will pay it. You can do it as long as it feels good about it. But for it to be a show, it might be so. Right? So solution, right? So um, you look at the solution itself that you want to propose. Um, for each of these problems laid out. So the solution to correspond to the problem hypothesis, right? So what exactly is the problem in order to deliver the USP, right? The UVP itself, the unique value proposition to your customers. Right? So once you have the solution, you may become in many form. So I'd like to share with this, right? Um, you know, if you were to sign up for Eden today to have a, a confirmation that, you know, this event is happening, right? There's many ways to give a confirmation, right? So you want to give a confirmation, that confirmation is a solution to inform the users that they have signed up for this event today, correct? But the means to achieve this uh, confirmation could be in various ways. It could be through an app, it could be through uh, a website, it could be through email, it could be through a message, many ways. Right? These are the different means to achieve the solution, okay? So moving on to the channels, important to you know, list out the pathways you can reach out to your customers or potential customers, the distribution channel to reach them, be it online, offline, inbound, outbound marketing base. Yeah. So revenue streams is next. If you look at the list of revenue sources, I would say that keep your business model simple, not just for yourself, your customers, but also your investors to know that you know exactly how you're making your revenue, how how do your business operate, what's the business model. We start with one very simple pricing model and you can expand it from there. Okay, important thing is that you have to find out your customer lifetime value, right? It's very important. I'll move on to that later on. Your cost, right? All the fixed costs, variable costs, the cost of, of uh, the servers, uh, the, the, the overheads, right? All these are different things that you have to put into the, the, the business model. So you have the customer acquisition costs, right? To acquire a user on, on board uh, and then convert them to a customer, how much it costs you to do so, right? Okay, key matrix. Key matrix is where uh, you measure what is success, right? Everyone determines success differently because, you know, we have different expectations, right? So to someone uh, in, in Singapore, maybe to them, success would mean, uh, I know an average worker would probably, oh, we need to make at least $10,000 per month for, for it to be successful, for me to live a better quality of life. Uh, whereas a, a person from another country or somewhere else would probably have lesser expectations, but they feel that you know success means you know you could be happier, right? Because I was quite impressed when I look at Botswana, right? The, the happiness index of Botswana is rather high, right? And that's one of the highest facts uh, in the region. And it's something that uh, we don't have a lot in Singapore because we are so fast moving. The it, the pace is so fast, and and pretty much a lot of 
people are not as happy okay because of different expectations so i come to a conclusion that you know we want to be happier expect less right so this is when you're looking back to the startup itself right so what are the kind of metric uh, weekly growth monthly growth annual uh, your CEO, uh, ideally three is to one, which means your customer lifetime value uh, over your customers across to be three. So uh, for every one dollar spent uh, to acquire this customer, and you actually get three dollars over a long time, uh, a long period of time, right? As long as you're on our platform and a payback period to your investors, etc. Okay. So other things that other companies, successful companies use is that uh, one of it is actually uh, Seconds Watch, right? So Twitch is a very famous live streaming uh, platform uh, used by gamers. So how do you measure the success of the Seconds Watch on the platform, right? So CLV over CAC ratio. So this is the one I'm talking about. Um, the customer lifetime value over customer acquisition cost. How to calculate your customer lifetime value is important, right? So the order value on average on your platform that they're purchasing, the product they purchase, the frequency of them purchasing, right? If you are, if you are maybe selling a mobile game, so how frequently are they actually purchasing in-app credits, for example, right? And what's the margin of profits have, right? The gross margin. Okay, that, that's how you calculate the customer lifetime value. And customer acquisition cost is essentially the amount of money spent uh, and over by how many customers acquired, right? So if you spend a marketing bu budget of $10,000 and you acquire um, 10,000 customers, which means every, every customer acquired is a dollar. But if you spend 10, you get 1,000 customers, then the cost of it acquiring user will be $10, right? Uh, many ways to do this. Uh, you, can, you can also see customer exchange costs as the marketing dollar spent on Facebook to get a lead, uh, and converting them from a lead to a customer, a paying customer. Yeah, so this are uh, customer acquisition costs. Okay, so important note, uh, this is how you should calculate your ratio. This is very important matrix because your customer lifetime value should always be a lot more than, you know, three times more than customer acquisition costs, right? Okay, so unfair advantage is something that you know, it can't be copied or bought easily, right? Uh, it could be an IP, right? Uh, intellectual property rights, uh, something unique about your team, yeah, specific special uh, specialty. I see that you know some of you have a health tech, a fintech, food tech, even. So these are certain research that was done that probably can't be copied around the world. Okay, your domain expertise, right? Your team domain expertise, the product defensibility. You know, uh, is there any patents on it, etc. The core technologies, the stickiness, right? So it's important, you know, it's similar to to branding, right? how sticky would the user be on your platform, on your product, right? Do they come back for more, right? If you can't think much about technology, think about Coca-Cola, right? Why do people always, you know, be coming back for more Coke, right? Uh, be it on a sunny day, on a rainy day, on the days they feel down. Why? Because they brand themselves as a source of happiness, right? When you drink Coca-Cola, you feel happy or happier, right? So the kind of branding it takes time to build on, but that ensures the stickiness of customers and they coming back for more. So over a lifetime period, how much will you have you spent on Coca-Cola, right? Probably 10,000, 20,000, even 100,000, depending how frequently you drink them, right? And why can't incumbents do the same? Most of it, I would say technology is one thing, but the key thing is the branding. How, do, how, do the, how does the customer, how does the public actually view you, right? Do you see their values aligned, right? Because we are moving on to the, the fourth industrial revolution, we have the younger generation, Generation Z, uh, that are looking at uh, brands that are aligned with their values, right? being socially responsible. All these are aspects that will help improve your branding and customer buying decisions, all right? So great. So we have pretty much covered the Lean Canvas. I uh, did a quick crash course on it to understand each of the segment of the Lean Canvas. Um, once you may have a template, feel free to fill up the Lean Canvas, uh, right? Or, Always rewatch this video if you require. Okay, so um, if we were to you know compress the link canvas to the four simple steps, it would be who is your customer, right? What's the problem they have? Uh, what's the solution they need? Then you build a minimum viable product, right? Uh, or minimum valuable product in this case because you're making something really quick, right? A quick to solve the problem, uh, simple solution. You don't have to be your final product, 
a really quick one you can use Adobe XD, uh, InVision app, uh, many, many existing platforms to actually create a mock-up of your application and then test the user feedback. But that's very important, right? You need validation. Okay. So I'd like to touch a little bit more on uh, market size itself. So this is important because this business uh, investors actually look at this, you know, your total addressable market, your serviceable addressable market and serviceable obtainable market. All right. So essentially, total addressable market could be a worldwide population online, right? If you are doing a e-commerce business, right? You know, Amazon surf all around the world, okay? But then, you know, if you are then Amazon for B two B, perhaps, right? And you want to look at the serviceable addressable market, perhaps maybe you can only look at Botswana because that's where you're familiar with. So that's your serviceable addressable market. Whereas your serviceable optimal market maybe is within the town or the district in Botswana that you live in that you can reach easily. Okay, so that's how you identify your market size. Um, this is where you should do this. Um, if you have time, uh, please fill this up. Okay, so this is a more advanced uh, and more realistic curve of the startup self. So the startup journey itself uh, usually is a J curve where uh, many times you don't break even uh, until early stage uh, after you've reached maybe uh, uh, you know, pre-series A round, etc. Right? And many companies actually don't pass the break even point, especially this COVID-19 period where many of the companies close now. Right? Uh, you know, you know, even the stuff itself, uh, Thousand time the company that closed down, you know, because of this COVID nineteen. Yeah, well, Singapore is very uh, reliant on trade, globalization, tourism, etc. Right, but as the company that survived, they'll do exceptionally well, right? Because these are the companies who are fulfilling customer needs. You know, um, in the food tech, for example, right? So, no doubt, right? Food is probably one of the uh, most important thing we need. We also need finance, so fintech, health. Uh, so many of these different segments are where some of the startups or companies feel that they have an advantage over the rest because they are more of a need than a good to have. Okay, so of course you look over time, you have a very uh, early stage all the way to later stage and the number of startups drops, right? Uh, so we have a couple of very good uh, startups uh, and the successful ones uh, yet to IPO will be uh, Grab, uh, which is one of the top few uh, invested uh, value, valuation startups in, in, in Southeast Asia and also worldwide. Uh, we have uh, C Group, which is IPO, right? So they are uh, uh, online gaming um, platform. Yeah. So there are many, many successful cases. And I believe 10 of you startups who are here listening to this is good first step. I believe you guys will be a success for Botswana as well. Okay. Uh, um, if you're looking for certain funding, there's many funding. In fact, many of the companies, you know, when spending to Southeast Asia, Asia, many of them are just not as a very low tax, uh, and we support the companies, you know, with a lot of grants. Uh, why? Because we want to have this uh, overseas uh, companies coming to create demand. Uh, uh, higher engine lens here and our uh, region, right? So, South fourth largest economy, right? Uh, um, and Singapore itself has been a global headquarters or regional headquarters in Asia Pacific for many of the corporates I mean, CS. And, and so, if you're a Singapore based company, you just to register company Laos, uh, for or no, no, not to worry. You just need to have a nominee director. Um, if you're, you're a privately limited company, there's less than five paid up capital of fifty thousand dollars. I'm not sure how much that would be if you convert to uh, any uh, intellectual property or emission in it, right? And potential scalability. Uh, you have a third party. To and you're not a subsidiary or joint venture, then definitely you're able to apply for startup edge. Yeah. What does 
potentially you're able to raise money from this seed this capital by the government. Two million dollars for Genentech and four million and one is still reaching. So if you were to raise uh, one million dollar from a VC, the government match you now one million dollars to your investment round. All right. Uh, if you are you are looking at deep tech sectors or startups, so recently because of uh, the the new budget that was released, uh, Singapore is trying to attract more advanced manufacturing, pharmaceutical, biotech, med tech, agriculture, food tech, um, to come to Singapore because these are essentials that we need in our ecosystem. Right, fintech um, has been growing, but we're looking more for deep tech now and. The, value, the, the investment cap has increased from $4 million to $8 million. So which means you can use the one man up to $8 million. All right? So money is really not an issue. Uh, essentially, you have to have a product that solves a pain point and has potential for scale. All right? Because remember, a startup is a, is a temporary organization that is looking for a scalable and repeatable business model. Okay? So uh, a co-assurance here, we are a venture builder. Uh, we're funded by the BS Quest Ventures. We are, have the a good team you to take your startup further. We essentially uh, build the technology to you, help you to go to market. And it's been a good five years now. Uh, we have two steps to acquisitions, uh, one of which really a, a travel plan application that was acquired by an Indonesian company. We're happy to be able to support this young founder. Uh, we also have many programs that we do here at uh, uh, um, we you know, supported uh, universities uh, through an entrepreneurship summer school program where we have over 10 com countries coming down to Singapore to experience uh, the entrepreneur program. We also conducted workshops on Industry 4.0 in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and on demand, we have like uh, colleagues you know, who have a uh, a CSR program or employee welfare benefits where they send their kids to a startup boot camp right, to build an entrepreneurial mindset. You also could do that. Uh, we help corporate to do some management because if they're not, uh, BNP Paribas, bank, we do a startup, but we go some tour for them uh, when they're regional. C suites come to Singapore to understand more of this, right? We also, uh, this was Kazakhstan from 2018 for a market program because they are planning to expand their business here to Singapore and Southeast Asia. So then again, the map 2017 that I did for the government uh, and, and they paid me to do this. Right, to have a few. So if you're looking for something like this, feel free to reach out. Uh, I think the key thing here is about sustainable partnerships, right? Because no one entity could achieve success on its own. You need an ecosystem to support one another. You need institutions to give you good talents. You need the government to give you support in your regulations. You need corporates to provide you your first customer if you're your B2B business. You need investors to give you initial seed fund, scale your operations. You need accelerators to help you to take your idea forward, scale into new markets, and you need incubators if you are early stage to incubate your ideas in a co-working space as well, right? So, uh, we will stick holding them together. And as I should you have this in Singapore, and we are ready to welcome you here. So, so this is our client years, so of our, our partners and supporters, and this is a feedback. So if you enjoy this session, please feel free to you know, take a phone, scan this QR code, or you can type the, the link below, uh, bit.ly slash gensg feedback. Okay, I think I'm done. Okay, Theo, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting presentation on the Singapore startup ecosystem. Um, I particularly appreciated what, what you have to share. Um, and I see that colleagues have been writing to me privately asking uh, if they can uh, interject uh, and ask you a few questions. Um, I think at this juncture, I would like to open up for um, 
for Q&A, uh, for discussion around the presentation. Um, mainly it's meant for, uh, for the startups that are pitching, but I, I guess also generally for those uh, who are busy building their startups. Uh, you will find that the framework that's been shared um, is, a, is an international framework that would uh, work in your benefit. So I think if you, if you have any comment um, that you would like to make, uh, you could at this point raise your hand and then we will unmute you so that you can directly uh, ask Theo the question. Let me start with you, Kosi. I see that you had uh, wanted to comment. I'm just going to unmute you. Okay, any, any other colleague while Kosi is trying to get ready? Um, just raise your hand. At the bottom of your screen, um, you should be able to... In the Zoom group chat, your question directly, and then we will uh, be able to see it and address it. So maybe tell you while they are preparing to ask the question, I was gonna precisely ask you to go back to, you know, uh, the differentiator because you know where we sit, uh, especially in Botswana. I, I think I've discussed it with you at length about this that we we are seeing more of, of a lot of the young young enterprises building more of uh, what I would call small medium enterprises as opposed to actual startups. Uh, and I think when you share the model, which you have shared, it's important that they understand the difference between the two, uh, because then ultimately it becomes difficult for, for any companies to scale if they're an SME, because for me, an SME is something that remains in the local market, whereas a startup is something, as you've shown, has exponential growth to go beyond the border and actually attract the type of funding that you show. Maybe you could maybe just speak a little bit about that so that they understand the value proposition in terms of this new element of startup economy that everybody is busy talking about. All right. Okay. So uh, there are pros and cons. It's not that SMEs are not good or startups are not good, but essentially the, the degree of risk that you would like to take. So as for investors, similarly, right? So the degree of risk you have to take if you invest in the early stage startup or risky later stage startup. And of the early stage startups, it is still riskier than an IPO company. Right. But of course, you look at this uh, startup that enables a huge growth, right? So the growth not within your region, but globally or regionally. All right. And, and what goes at that huge amount of injection in terms of funding, uh, a better off to show of startups. So the green one is for startups, exponential growth. But in actual fact, most of the startups are in this space. So you look at this startup J curve, right? Where you are below the break even point because you actually borrowed money for investors, be it convertible note or you have some funding, or you have a grant, or you're both for French families or fools, and you call it the three Fs. Uh, so essentially, you have a lot of you know, loans to be paid, right? And once you make enough revenue, the profits then help you create a break-even point, and subsequently, at a later stage of funding, that's where you exponentially grow, okay? Uh, but of course, many startups at this case was then four, as you see the number of startups as you just were half, and goes as little as, you know, uh, one out of 10 startups will eventually succeed. So nine out of 10 actually fail, right? So the risk of failure is really high. And many times, if you look at the eight, top 10 reasons why startup founders fail, it's also product market fit, right? Uh, the founders themselves even, right? So many of these issues are happening. And, and these, in this case, are, won't happen as much in SMEs because SMEs, you have a proven model, probably it's a franchise, probably it's a existing business, uh, service business, or even uh, something that is an essential need, right? So if you were to sell uh, your F&B store and you sell uh, maybe, you know, we have a very famous chicken rice in Singapore. So chicken rice is one of the famous dishes here in Singapore and rice for the past 20, 30 years, right? Yes, people will just keep coming. Even if it's COVID-19, people will ask for delivery and the business just grows, right? Business will grow away where it's a linear growth. Right? But of course, as time goes by, you get older, you don't have someone else over business, and eventually it might just go off. 
you know, and, and it ceased to exist. Whereas a startup on that hand could take this business forward and create innovative solutions to actually scale the business. And you know, it could even be uh, chicken rice in a box, for example, and then been sold globally around the world, right? So many, many ways to disrupt with internet, with industry 4.0. Um, I think startup founders are able to you know, leverage on the ability to move fast and being very lean, right? And lean, being lean means don't waste resources, right? So I hope that answers your question. Hello. You're muted, I can't hear you. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, in terms of the, the, the canvas itself, um, is, is it the right tool to say startups should start from uh, as opposed to writing a business plan? Because, you know, a lot of the funding uh, organizations uh, in our market would ask the startups to actually put together uh, a business plan with financials. Whereas what we see here is, you know, um, it's sort of a canvas that actually shows um, a summarized element of the business uh, case itself, but in a one pager, which ultimately also comes in the form of a pitch deck. Perhaps that's something that maybe you can let the startups know uh, a bit about because this is where we capture the value in one page. Yes, great. So, um, well, you are at least a startup, investors don't have time to look through a 10 page, 20 page, or even a 100 page business business proposal um, just to find out if they're interested in your idea. So this canvas itself, you know, focus on the essential things that investors would like to see for you to articulate your business to the customers or even potential partners or in one. Just it's nice that because uh, very nice projection in your financials, but are these realistic? Are these what customers actually willing to pay for? Are these just assumptions? Have it been validated? Right. Your financials could be you know, one, three, five years, but without validation of actual customer paying you, projection is as good as nothing, right? You're just wasting your time going out, uh, projecting revenues, but you're not being able to be realistic about the consumer demands. So I'll say this is the modern way of presenting your business um, to show uh, investors and get them to be interested in what you're doing. So it gives you a better way to articulate what you try to achieve for a startup. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I think also just to mention, colleagues, we, we will share this uh, tool uh, to all the uh, uh, participants for free, uh, KTC of, J, of JTO. We will give this uh, tool for those that need it. Um, it will be shared in the, in the chat box. You can just download it directly into your phone or computer. Uh, I see Waubak is as unmuted. Uh, please, please go ahead with your question. Aubakwe uh, Mutang, you can go ahead. We, we have unmuted you. All right. Uh, one of my main questions would be, is there, in terms of startup collaborations, uh, like we can learn from the startups uh, that are existing probably in other continents. Is there any platform of maybe learning and then in a startup that has a similar model in another continent like in Singapore or in Asia so that we can have that collaboration. Do you have something like that uh, in, your, in your area? Yes. So if you look at the Gen Network, we 
have essentially 170 countries in this network. Mm. Uh, uh, Mukesi itself is in Botswana, myself in, in Singapore, we have all the other network partners in the best of the 170 world countries. So if you were to reach out to us and you tell us this is something that you're looking at to expand in a particular country, we can you know, seek the network partners to identify similar startups or business models that you could reference to, or you can understand more of the market, or you can provide some form of consultation on that. Because it's important, I think, to raise a point, it's very good because we need to understand what are the existing players in the market, right? Don't reinvent the wheel, right? Because every single market have different cultures, language, and the behavioral aspect of the individuals are different, right? If you talk about the clean energy and technology itself, right, it's a rising space where clean tech itself, you know, aims to be uh, projected to be 28.9 billion by year 2024, right? And many of the clean tech startups itself are, have different needs in different regions, right? If you were to, you know, have a, a solar company uh, that has lots of Solar panels, put solar panels on our uh, window because we are the space. Think of having a visual uh, dam in Singapore. You are going to power water by Singapore. Definitely, no Singapore infrastructure, the size of the country, don't able, don't allow you to have hydro or, or wind power. So it really depends on the region you are expanding to, the type of companies you are doing, the industry you are in, and network partners are able to help. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, I actually have a short video to share about the, you know, the experience with the Kazakhstan founders when it came to Singapore. Just let me share this screen with you. Well, the question can keep on coming to my screen here. Can you see my screen? Can you see the video? Yes, we, we can see the video. Awesome, great. This was in October in 2018, where we hosted them uh, in, in partnership with the... So that's pretty much it. When they came over to Singapore, we brought them around to explore the ecosystem uh, in various industries. You could see, you know, water, clean tech, uh, advanced robotics, uh, social enterprises, uh, early stage startups, incubation centers. Uh, so that gives you a good overview of a period of one week to understand the sense. Yeah, thank, thank you for that comment. Um, I think we have another comment there in the chat box. Uh, one of the colleagues, Araban, says, great insights. Uh, he asked the question, how do you navigate around actually launching after having developed your, uh, your MVP? Uh, MVP would mean a minimum viable product and having got, a, having got validation. Okay, so um, I think, we need to identify what is validating there's a thing called the validators that we do teach as well. Uh, you can actually Google it yourself as well, called validators. I'll just type it out here for you. All right. Um, you have to validate a few points. First is the problem and the solution and then customers. Okay. So, Uh, stages of validation of your MVP because your MVP itself is essentially the minimum viable product. A good example of MVP would be, um, you know, if you think of the image of a donut, um, let me see if I have an image of it just to show you. Yeah, here it is. So I like to show this image because I think that's the best image to represent MVP, right? So if for those who don't know what MVP means, this is essentially what you do, right? So when you have your, uh, you know, potential customers have expressed interest to find out more of a product, you have an MVP, and that might not be final product, right? Because oh, you know, the chocolate have rice in there, the, the yeah. yeah. So that is what I feel uh, is best on MVP. So there's many tools for MVP, right? Uh, one of it would be.
Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. Okay, so so um, once you have the MVP, I think uh, at a validation stage with your customers, the best validation will be them paying you. Right? Uh, Kickstarter is for, or Indiegogo is a very good platform for validation of or MVP and, and your idea itself, right? Because customers actually do pay you. Uh, and, and sometimes, um, of course, you have to deliver what you promise. And I feel that um, the, the validation itself wouldn't just be one off, right? You, it could be successful for, for, the, for this one month, the next two, three months, but it might not be in demand for the next one or two years. So you have to keep improving on it, right? And upgrading your version of, of product itself to fit customer demands because you know, we're moving so fast, right? You look at social media, right? If you know of this platform called TikTok. So TikTok is a social platform where people come in to put videos, entertainment, and, and uh, songs even, you know, dancing to the music and, and challenging each other. This whole integration of the different aspects of the social media and on our internet actually helps drive a lot of traction especially to younger people, right? And, and uh, earlier days, you look at Facebook, right? When even though after they launched a the product, uh, they realize though, they are losing their market share because uh, then Instagram become more popular with the younger people and Facebook then you know, only be used by older people. So then they bought over Instagram for a billion dollars. And subsequently, they tried to also acquire Snap, right? Snapchat, but eventually uh, they didn't do so because Snap refused to be acquired and they wanted to on their own. And then they, they con conveniently just, you know, copied uh, or say or reference uh, the functions of chat and put in Instagram and we can help. At this stage of it, we improve your uh, customer demand. Right? It's evidence. So I see there are now questions here right, about the role of startups in the Singapore economy and the extent of government you know, designing the economic planning around startups. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will say that the startups uh, they are essentially the line for innovation, right? For growth, right? Uh, we have many MNCs here in Singapore. Uh, at the moment now, I will say the MNCs are doing a lot of the work in hiring more people, whereas the startups are still growing. Or they don't hire as much people at the, as SME, uh, so MNCs, right? And but but they have potential for growth to scale overseas to bring our people uh, and 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 the fellow uh, startups and and talents around the region to come to Singapore and also to grow the economy as a whole. So I'll say, uh, the government play a very strong role in in this startup ecosystem, and the startup itself help in many of the government. Uh, uh, roles, uh, you know, being a very competitive economy and uh, and and in the world, um, if we, you know, one thing I learned from our founding father Lee Kuan Yew, who is the founding prime minister of Singapore, is that if Singapore is not being competitive, we are not in the top one or two places in export to do it because we are such a small country, no one will actually even notice us. Why would they even come up to to Singapore, right? So that will also drive tourism, people coming down to Singapore, uh, to drive the economy. Uh, forward, yeah. So I think the startups play a very crucial role to the economy, and the government is putting a lot of resources into it. Yeah. So th thank you for that, uh, colleagues. Anybody who would like to, we have exactly two minutes to wrap wrap this up. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand, um, so that we can take the last comment. If you would like, if you're not confident to speak, you can just type it in the chat box before we wrap up. Okay, Teo, it looks like we, we don't have any, any questions uh, at, at this point. Um, what would be your, um, um, what would be your, 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 your message to, uh, you know, to the startup ecosystem in Botswana, uh, particularly the, the youth? Uh, because when I looked at a lot of your pictures, I saw a lot of youth. Um, and uh, I guess those are the people building the tech companies. Uh, what would be your message, particularly to the youth building the companies? Uh, what are the resources uh, and capabilities that they need to be able to succeed 
and obviously the issue of uh, the three Fs, you know, uh, uh, will this be uh, an issue that's led by females? Uh, will it be driven by funding? Uh, will it also require one to make sure that they target uh, countries that have a certain uh, fiscal strength? And also, is, it this, is this about cities? Uh, the startup economy, is it about cities? So I uh, just in, in wrapping up those three questions, uh, if you can answer them. Sorry, Ted. I think you need to you need to unmute. <laughs> yeah, Ted, can can you just unmute yourself? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just, uh... Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so, so I was saying, um, I think a key thing here is, is really about um, not just for the youth, right? So in our, in our various uh, engagements, many of them are corporates, youth coming all together um, and learning from one another because the youth bring this fresh perspective they, they, they are not taught or they have not experienced, you know, or being told what not to do, what you can't do. So they're giving a fresh perspective in how can they bring value to the organization that are part of. So I think, you know, it's not just youth who will be able to be uh, successful in doing a startup, but also I'll say, you know, in, in, in recent years, we see more of the corporate uh, individuals, executives who are actually leaving the, the corporate space and going to startups are actually more successful because they have to, the understanding of the, 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 the situation in the ground, right? So, so they understand the problem a lot better than the young startup founders do. So I think there's a very good collaboration here where the corporate executives and the startup founders, uh, young startup founders come together to do a startup and that will be a very good collaboration because when you do a startup, the first important thing you need to do is you have your initial uh, early adopters and also your first customer, right? First paying customer, which I think the networks you get when you are in an MNC or in a corporate space or you have been running an SME for a couple of years to give you the experience and the connections to do so, right? Alternatively, you can always reach out to Jen and, and our fellow network partners to actually help you to, to connect you with the relevant parties, all right? And with, uh, uh, with regards to your point about the, the female is this uh, sixty percent of our team are right? actually because I feel that you know um, um, I wouldn't want to say about the COVID nineteen situation, but if you look at it across the world, uh, female leaders tend to be able to control the situation better, and the countries eventually get better. So New Zealand, for example, they already eradicate COVID nineteen as a whole, right? So really kudos to them for that. Um, so uh, women in the team is very important because they are. They are the, at least for my team, they are more detailed, they are able to show more empathy, they are able to understand the customers better, they are able to communicate their ideas across efficiently. And many times, uh, they have a lot of complement, complementary factors to, to males, right? And I believe in a gender equality, so I think both male and female should have equal rights to succeed in the startup space and also in, in their line of work. So if I have to wrap up and to give one quote uh, or take away to any of the young founders or even uh, SME owners who are looking at this would be uh, give value and you'll be valued because essentially if you're not giving value, uh, their customers do value you for, then you're, you're not a need, right? You're just fulfilling a good to have. So I feel that, you know, if you're able to give value, then that's where the real value will come from, you know, from your customers, from your users, and even for our investors. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, colleagues, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jerry Teo from uh, Singapore, the startup uh, ecosystem lead for, for Singapore. I would like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, from the startup ecosystem in Botswana for your insights. Uh, we have greatly learned quite a lot. Uh, I believe that uh, the knowledge um, and the tools you have given us will help a lot of our startups to scale and to build um, uh, towards the economy. 
Um, we, we would like to commit to continue this conversation with you beyond this. I've personally challenged you to say uh, if you can make it uh, to Forbes um, in December when it's hosted in Botswana. We have friends in the corporate world. Some of them are joining this session. I guess they, they will see the need um, to actually engage on a deep dive. Uh, we also, as, as, as committed between myself and you, uh, we hope that we can continue these virtual engagements with those that are interested to engage directly with you. Uh, the contacts have been put on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen for all of us to contact you. Uh, I would like to thank you specifically for, for taking time. I know it's late where you are. Um, and thank you so much for this. Uh, and we hope that you, you continue to spread the message of, uh, of this emerging early stage ecosystem called Botswana, <laughs> uh, where you are. And hopefully one of our startups is able to make it into your ecosystem and uh, vice versa uh, for, for, from your side. So at this juncture, colleagues, I would like to request the session to end. Uh, the next session, uh, by luck, we have uh, one of our, our corporate CEOs uh, from a very uh, interesting bank called Stambek Bank. It's coming in at exactly um, 10.45. Uh, please join in and, and uh, share the link with others so that they can benefit from this knowledge. So Teo, uh, on behalf of the, of, of, the, of the ecosystem and the project, uh, thank you very much. We are signing off. Thank you. Thank you.